good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, it's the second of a series of four webinars as we observe Old Americans Month. And this webinar speaks to diabetes, lifestyle changes to target diabetes and obesity. Our presenter today is Keisha Lewis. Keisha Lewis is a practicing occupational therapist and a certified diabetes care and education specialist with more than 17 years of experience working in the fields of human services, mental health, and physical disability. She serves as a consultant with the Health and Wellness Program for National Council Caucus and Center on Black Aging. In 2019, Keisha co-founded Weldom LLC, an aging in place consultancy. Keisha's ultimate focus is empowering individuals with the skills they need to be independent in their environment without fear. Thank you and welsh welcome Keisha. I now turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, Ms. T, and hi, everyone um, out there in Zoom land. Um, today, I'm, I'm hopeful that I can share some insight um, on diabetes and obesity. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our objectives for today. So our objectives are to uh, define um, diabetes and obesity um, and define the term diabetes. And then we'll also discuss the link between diabetes and obesity. We'll identify uh, diabetes and obesity statistics for you, and we'll identify some of the risks associated with diabetes and obesity. Um, identify means to reduce the risk for diabetes and obesity, and then identify some resources that are available to you. So first I wanted to go over what the definition of diabetes is. So diabetes is a disease in which your body does not make enough insulin or the insulin that your body is making, you're not properly making it. Um, and insulin, insulin is simply a hormone that's needed to turn sugar and starches and other foods and energy needed um, in our daily life. So some of the statistics with diabetes, um, diabetes is increasing and um, it is in our communities at an alarming rate right now. And we see now that new cases of diabetes, it's almost 1.4 million new cases uh, every year. So we can see that 37.3 million people currently have diabetes and 8.5 million people are undiagnosed with diabetes. And then we have another 96 million people that have a condition known as prediabetes. So when we also, we compare different ages for diabetes in the senior population, what we're finding is that from the age of uh, 45 to 64, we're seeing higher rates of diabetes. And then those age 65 and older, we're also seeing higher rates of diabetes than we did before. So that's compared to adults in the age range of 18 to 44. Um, so this uh, uh, map is just showing you an age-adjusted county level prevalence of diabetes over the last several years. So if you go back and you look at 2004 and you move to 2019, um, you'll see that the shaded area now has become much darker. So we've gone from a, a less percentage of diabetes or prevalence of diabetes to a greater percentage of diabetes present in the United States. Um, and you can also see with the shaded area, the darker area shows the increased uh, percentage in a certain region. So there are certain regions that you see that diabetes is more prevalent or diabetes is on the rise in those communities. So some of the risk factors for diabetes include being overweight, um, experiencing abdominal obesity, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, physical inactivity, um, having a history of smoking, being over the age of 45, having a family history of diabetes. And then we see certain ethnic groups are more at risk for diabetes. So African-American, Hispanic, uh, Latin, the Latinx community, Native Americans, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders. Um, also in women that have experienced gestational diabetes, they're more likely to have type two diabetes later in life. 
And then those individuals with abnormal cholesterol and blood pressure uh, readings also are more at risk for diabetes. So something that you can do um, to actively see, okay, do I have risk uh, for developing diabetes? The American Diabetes Association, they have a diabetes uh, toolkit, a diabetes risk tool assessment. So you can go on diabetes.org and you can actually do a simple test for yourself or for one, someone in your family um, to let you know what are your risks um, and identify what those risks are. So the link is diabetes.org and I would encourage you to actually take that assessment um, to see, you know, am I at risk and what can I do about it? So next we're going to talk about obesity. So obesity is actually a disease. And so when we think about it, you know, a lot of times people have thought that obesity is something that is a choice or a lifestyle change. And what we're finding more and more of is that the CDC, they define overweight and, and obesity in adults as weight that is higher than what is considered healthy or given height. But in 2013, the American Medical Association designated obesity as a disease. And the Obesity and Medicine Association, uh, they came out with a statement in an obesity algorithm that they had that defines obesity as a chronic, relapsing, multifactorial neurobehavioral disease, where an increase in body fat promotes adipose tissue, dysfunction, abnormal fat mass, physical forces, resulting in uh, metabolic, biomechanical, biomechanical, and psychosocial health consequences. So that was a whole mouthful that I just said. So if we look at the definition of actually what a chronic disease is, the CDC says that a chronic disease is a condition that lasts for one or more years and it requires ongoing medical attention and it can limit physical activities and activities of daily living. So that big mouthful that I just read, that's pretty much what it's saying is that obesity is a chronic illness and it can cause physical changes and it's lasting more than a year. And obesity can ultimately affect our physical abilities as well as our abilities to perform our activities of daily living, such as dressing, bathing, um, mobility. And so, and another alarming statistic is, um, as I was working on this presentation, was that actually one in three adults were considered to be overweight and one in three adults were considered to have obesity. Um, and so with obesity, and we'll put that connection together later, but obesity currently is driving up to half of all type 2 diabetes cases in the United States. Um, and obesity has an overwhelming prevalence in the African-American and Black community. So we see that four out of five African-American women are overweight and obese. So some of the factors that we have that affect weight include family history or genetics, race and ethnicity, age, sex, um, eating um, and physical activity habits, the environment, um, family habits and culture, as well as sleep habits. So there are many factors that can affect your weight and lead to overweight and obesity. Um, and actually some of these factors make it very hard for you to lose weight or to avoid regaining weight that you have lost. Um, and it's important to note that our genes play a factor in this. So your genes actually can affect the amount of fat that your body stores and which areas your body actually stores fat in. Um, and we know that, and I'll talk about this more in maybe the next slide, but some racial and ethnic minority groups are more likely to have obesity. And so we see obesity rates um, in Americans highest in the African-American community, followed by the Hispanic community. Um, and we also see that more women experience obesity than men. So other factors that affect weight can be certain medical conditions, um, certain medications we take, 
eating disorder and stress. Um, another interesting find as I was doing some of my research for this presentation was that back in March, um, the American uh, Psychological Association found that during the pandemic that 42% of adults in the United States reported gaining an undesired amount of weight. Um, and what was interesting about that is that on average, the adults in the United States reported that they gained an average of 29 pounds during the pandemic. Um, and I thought back to during that time, we were in the house, we weren't as active, um, total lifestyle change and adjustments. And so many of us experience a, a ungodly amount of stress. Um, and what I also found interesting was I was listening to a NPR interview um, in which they interviewed Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. And she's one of the leading experts in obesity uh, medicine and research at Harvard University um, or Harvard Medical School. And one of the things that she stated was when we look at factors that play a role in rising obesity rates, she said, we know that stress is one of them. And I had not really thought about that. And so when you think about it, um, she says stress doesn't just affect exercise and eating pattern. It also prompts the body to store more fat. Who knew that? I did. <laughs> um, and she says during the pandemic, other factors, including food insecurity and reduced access to recreation, made it more likely that everyone from children to older adults would gain weight. So again, obesity is already in, at epidemic proportions. Um, then we have the stress and the things we experienced in the pandemic that added to that, um, along with the physical inactivity. So now we have um, one thing on top of an, another. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that more. So when we look at the frequency of obesity, and in particular, what I did was I targeted or I wanted you to see just self-reported obesity rates among U.S. adults by state. Um, and then I broke the chart down here, the graph uh, that came from the CDC. And I wanted to show you the prevalence of self-reported obesity among non-Hispanic Black adults by state and territory. So if you look at this map, you actually see um, the reason of why, you know, African-Americans are at, not maybe why, but you see the African-Americans um, or Black adults experience obesity more because you see the shaded area and that dark kind of red shaded area, if you want to call it burnt orange, um, you see that the first part, it's hard to see there on the, on the slide, but I think it's 30 to 40% is the lighter color orange. And then 40% is that darker hue that looks more like red. Um, so if you look at that, we see more of our Southern states are experiencing obesity um, epidemics, um, as well as more of the Southwest area. Um, it was a time the Southern states that kind of compromised like Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi. Um, that was once known and probably still is known as the stroke belt. Um, so you see, that yes, in certain areas where more African-American and black individuals live, we see higher rates of obesity. Now, when we look at, okay, well, let's talk about how do I know if I'm overweight or obese? So body mass index is a simple and inexpensive, easy way to calculate um, body weight and measurements. So body mass index is, um, used to determine whether someone is underweight at a healthy weight or overweight or obese. So it also predicts, um, it's a good predictor of whether we're at risk for developing cardiovascular outcomes or cardiovascular problems. So it's important for me to state about the BMI calculator that it was generated um, mostly from the white population. So over the years, there's been a lot of research and discussions to whether it should be used for minorities. Um, and the reason is we see that there's genetic differences um, in our body fat uh, patterns or our body fat distributions, and that differs by race and ethnicity. 
Um, and that's among uh, Hispanics, Blacks, uh, Southeast Asian populations. Um, and so there's a lot of studies out there to see, you know, is this actually still a valuable tool? Um, and so data from the tool actually supports different cutoffs for BMI depending on your, on your race or your ethnicity. Um, and so this BMI calculator, um, it is a calculator that's on the CDC site, which I've linked there. So you could actually go in and put your height um, and your weight and it would calculate and it would give you whether you're in the underweight, overweight or obese category. Um, and so what that chart looks like, I just wanted to show you briefly, is that there's a table and based on your height and your weight, it's going to give you what your BMI is, okay? And remember, this is simply a screening tool. Um, it's not a diagnostic tool to diagnose your body fat um, or your health. It's just a tool. Um, and it's non, it, it's a little less accurate in the non-white population. So I wanted to be able to make you aware of that. Then there's another tool that actually will calculate your risk for developing uh, cardiovascular disease. And that tool is just simply the waist circumference and your, your risk based on your waist circumference. So it's a good measure to help you measure fat around your middle section. Um, and that's important because this type of fat, it builds up around your organs and it's linked to high blood pressure. Um, it can be linked to diabetes as well as cardiovascular disease. So if most of your fat is around your waist rather than your hips, then you're at risk for uh, heart disease and type two diabetes. And this risk goes up, you see, in men, if the waist circumference is greater than 40 inches, and in women, if the waist circumference is greater than 35 inches. So that puts you at risk for developing cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And so on the right-hand side there, it's just showing you how you actually measure your waist circumference. Um, and I won't go into that a whole lot, but on the CDC's website, there is um, healthy, um, a link there um, for how you can actually measure your waist circumference. But I will highlight, you just need a tape measure um, and you're gonna stand and place a tape measure around your hips, uh, just above your hips, and you're gonna measure. And that will give you your waist circumference. So that's another way to identify your, your risk uh, for type two diabetes and for cardiovascular disease. Um, now this particular uh, chart or rates, um, what I wanted you to just see here is that diabetes and obesity rates um, in ethnic groups. So earlier I talked about the prevalence of diabetes is definitely higher among my minority groups um, compared to uh, just non-Hispanic whites. So black and Hispanic um, individuals um, are at higher rates. And so we see that in the chart. So I've broken it down by um, each uh, minority group. And you can see that there's a correlation where we see higher rates of obesity. We also see higher rates of diabetes in that population. Um, and one of the things that I found interesting um, was I saw that when it comes to Medicare beneficiaries, so our group of seniors, that the prevalence of diabetes was higher among minority beneficiaries compared to white beneficiaries. Um, and it was highest amongst black beneficiaries. Um, and then I also discovered that fewer black and Hispanic beneficiaries reported knowing about Medicare coverage policies for diabetes testing supplies and self-management education. Um, and that's something that as a community, um, we, can, we can help um, individuals understand that these benefits do exist um, for Medicare. So now it comes to the title of my presentation of diabetes. So diabetes plus obesity um, has often been termed diabetes. So it isn't an official diagnosis, um, but what that means is that you have both obesity and you have type two diabetes. 
So together, these two are closely related conditions and they greatly increase your risk of heart disease. Um, diabetes and obesity has actually been called the twin um, epidemics. So you, the two evil twins, I guess. So um, diabetes though, it is a monitored epidemic um, because both diabetes and obesity are on the rise in communities of color. Um, and we see that obesity has been linked to at least 30 to 53% of new diabetes diagnoses um, each year for the past two decades. Um, and again, remember both diabetes and obesity put you at risk for cardiovascular disease. And we're also seeing that um, African-Americans um, were 30% more likely to die from heart disease um, than non-Hispanic whites. And heart disease is a leading cause of death for men and women and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the, in the United States. Uh, and so with obesity-related complications, we often see heart disease, stroke, um, and type 2 diabetes. Um, and these things are preventable um, in premature death. So these are things that we can do something about to prevent death at an at a earlier age. So one thing I did want to say is I want to bust the myth. Um, because everyone with obesity does not develop diabetes and everyone with diabetes, or excuse me, everyone with diabetes does not always have obesity. So there are other factors that contribute to both and it can include family history. It can include diet, stress, um, lack of exercise, as well as our, our gut health. Um, but having obesity makes you more likely to develop diabetes. Um, and the most, I guess, common misconception, like I said earlier, is that obesity is simply a lifestyle disorder, um, that people have obesity simply because of their diet or their physical inactivity. Um, but obesity is really complex. And as I kind of dive deeper into doing this presentation, um, it changed some of my thoughts and ideas about obesity because it really is complex. And sometimes it's not about, oh, you just chose to have a bad lifestyle or you just chose not to exercise or you just chose to eat more. Um, and so that leads me to this slide, which we actually talk about social determinants of health. So social determinants of health, there are conditions in our environment where people are born, they live, they learn, they work, they play, um, they worship, they age. Um, and all of these factors affect a wide range of health and function and quality of life, as well as our risk and outcomes. So we see that social and economic factors really do impact health outcomes. So some social determinants of health include your income, your poverty level, um, your education, um, whether you have access to health insurance, um, the environment where you live. Um, do you have access to uh, local parks and gyms? Um, there's a physiological component to social determinants of health, as well as behavioral, um, our culture, our lifestyle, what we're used to. Um, a social aspect um, and, and, and an economic aspect as well. So all of these things can affect um, health outcomes. So then we go into complications. So complications related to diabetes um, that you see is you see cardiovascular complications that lead to stroke or heart attack. You see, you know, foot problems because of maybe neuropathy or decreased sensation. Kidney damage can be also a complication. Um, and then we see some of the obesity complications, heart disease, sleep apnea, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, diabetes, and certain types of cancer also are some of the complications that we see. Um, so these complications aren't inevitable, okay? Um, and then uncontrolled diabetes, again, and I focus on the word uncontrolled, okay? So uncontrolled diabetes can affect your eyes, cardiovascular system, your nerves, your kidneys, sexual function, they can affect your feet. 
Um, but these aren't inevitable. And again, I point out that word uncontrolled because these are things that we can do something about and impact. So obesity related complications, again, those complications, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, type two diabetes, sleep apnea, and certain types of cancer. So now we're gonna go into more of managing those risks and what we need to do. So managing diabetes involves healthy eating, monitoring your blood sugars, taking your medication if indicated, um, physical activity, lifestyle changes, and, and receiving diabetes education if you've been told you have diabetes. Managing obesity may involve healthy eating, regular physical activity, um, changing your habits, weight management programs, perhaps weight loss medications, weight loss devices, bariatric surgery or special devices or special diets, I'm sorry. So in the management of diabetes and in the management of obesity, there were some things that you saw there that were in common. And that included healthy eating, regular physical activity, changing your habits, lifestyle changes, those are all things that you can do uh, to help manage this. So some of the necessary lifestyle changes um, that we'll focus on is, you know, a five to seven percent weight loss if you're overweight. Um, that can really impact your health. So example would be if you weigh 200 pounds and you lose 10 pounds, that's going to be a difference. Um, for you to perform 30 minutes of moderate intense physical activity five or more days out of the week, that's going to make an impact on your health. Um, and then to also be able to make better food choices. Um, these are all going to impact your health and increase um, or decrease some of your risk. Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is that research has even shown that losing weight um, eating a healthy diet and increasing your physical activity can reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes up to 58% for those over 60. Um, this can be reduced up to 71%. So it's never too late to start making healthy and impactful changes in your health. So when it comes to being physical active, if this is not something that you currently do, I want you to check with your doctor and see if it's okay. Um, if you haven't been doing any exercise or activity, simply start with walking. Um, if you're already active, maybe choose an exercise more frequently or increase the time that you currently exercise. Um, and it's physical activity can lower your blood sugar. Um, it can reduce your weight too. Um, and what we recommend is that you exercise 30 minutes a day um, on most days. So try to engage, um, you know, your, your family or your friends and, you know, participating in doing some of this physical activity with you, um, because that can even help. And I will say, even if you walk 10 minutes after each meal, um, that would give you your 30 minutes over the course of the day. So start small and gradually try to build yourself up. Um, other tips I have on being active is just work towards that goal of 150 minutes a week. That goal comes from the CDC and the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, and that's just 30 minutes of physical activity, five or more days out of the week. Um, start slow and build up on your routine. Um, find an activity that you enjoy doing, like walking or biking or dancing. Um, make it fun and you're more likely to do it. Um, and then be active with a friend or family member. Try to add in some strength training, maybe weights, resistive bands. I um, mean, remember that doing something is better than doing nothing at all. And when we talk about small steps to help us uh, lose weight, um, remember weight loss is about balance. So if we have too much food and not enough activity, we're going to gain weight. If we have less food and more activity, um, we're going to lose weight. So once you have set a, a weight goal um, and you met it, you will need enough food and enough physical activity to maintain it. 
Um, and you could cut out 200 to 300 calories a day from food and burn an extra 200 to 300 calories with exercise every day. I mean, it can contribute to about a weight loss of two to four pounds a month. So in learning how to improve your diet, um, you want to try to consume less calories, lower your fat intake, um, consume a moderate, moderate amount of carbohydrates, and you want a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, um, high in fiber. And one of the best things you can do if you, you have trouble you know, knowing, okay, what are my food groups? What should I eat? What shouldn't I eat? Um, consult with a registered dietitian. Uh, most of your insurance plans will cover the cost of medical nutrition therapy. Um, so you can talk to a dietitian about, you know, what's balanced and what's right for me. And then I encourage you, you know, you build a healthy plate when you're eating. So devote more of your plate to your non-starchy vegetables. That's like your broccoli, your asparagus, your salad. Um, reduce portions of your rice, your pasta, your potatoes. Um, choose in var a various amount of lean proteins, and that's your chicken, your fish, your pork, um, and your turkey. And then go easy on creamy sauces and dressings. Those things tend to be um, high fat. Uh, and something as simple that you can try in the beginning is just use what we call the plate guide method. This is often used with diabetes. But what we say is in the plate guide method, you know, the largest half of your plate should be your non-starchy vegetables. And then a quarter of that plate is your, uh, your grains or your starches, and the other quarter there is your protein. Um, and one thing you'll notice about this plate, and I want you to remember, this is about a nine-inch plate. So I want you to stick with that nine-inch plate um, thought process and not get one of those big square plates that most of us have in the cabinet now because they're cute and fancy, um, but a small nine inch plate. And if you don't have one, go out and buy paper plates um, and look at the size of that plate. Um, the other thing that we run into is that we get a nine inch plate and what we do is we think, okay, I'm gonna pile it up high because everything can still fit on that plate. Um, so if you have a nine inch plate, and that plate is this tall, that's defeating the purpose. Um, and I want you to remember that too. Um, other things that you can do for meal planning tips, um, you can plan out your meals for the week because uh, you're more likely to have success into um, having a balanced meal. Um, you can use time saver um, tips like pre-chopped uh, vegetables and frozen vegetables. Um, I always say the freezer is your best friend because you can freeze stuff and prepare for later. And then how do you reduce calories? So if you find that you're overeating or you know that you're eating too many calories, try to keep a food journal for two to three days and identify you know, what you consider to be the extra. So what are the foods that are high in fat? What are the foods that are high in sugar? Um, write down what and how much you eat and then take a red pen or pink pen, whatever your choice, um, and circle all the extras and the high fat foods that you see that you're eating more of. And then decide what you're willing to change. Um, and, and don't change everything all at once. You know, Make one small change um, and stick with it. And earlier I referenced like the extra. So what actually is the extra in your diet? Um, and what I have here is juice. That's an extra, juice and soda. Those are extras. So juice is made up of 100% fruit juice, but it has very high sugar content. So to break this down, if you had a cup of juice, it has almost about the same amount of sugar as one cup of soda. And that's about seven teaspoons of sugar. So you would need three to four oranges to make one cup of juice. So drinking one cup of juice, you can consume the sugar of three to four oranges within a few minutes. So I would much rather you just have a piece of fruit and have some water. Um, you wanna choose whole fruits that you're gonna get vitamins from and minerals as well as fiber. Um, and if you have to have juice, you wanna limit juice to a half a cup and no more than that. 
small starts. Um, and then you wanna reduce your risk um, when possible, okay? So reducing the risk are possible um, because things that you can do, you can exercise, you can work on portion control, um, you can work on lowering your blood pressure and your cholesterol because that will also reduce your cardiovascular risk. Um, take medications as needed, whether they're for diabetes or whether they're helping you manage uh, overweight and obesity. Um, because these complications are not inevitable and things do not have to happen. So diabetes, diabetes and obesity um, can be successfully managed through monitoring your blood sugars, um, healthy eating, being physically active, taking medication, and then weight loss. So some of the resources um, that I can offer for prevention, and I'm going to try to wrap up soon as I can ask some, um, answer some questions, but um, this is just a resource. Um, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, um, if you have diabetes and you're having a difficult time managing your diabetes, endocrinologists are physicians that specialize in the management of diabetes, um, and they actually, um, you can find one on the American Association of Endocrinology. I'm the American Board of um, Obesity Medicine. If you are someone where you are experiencing um, overweight or obesity and you've tried many different things and things aren't working, um, here is where you can find a board certified um, physician in obesity medicine. Um, and then the American Diabetes Association has great resources about your risk for diabetes and um, helpful recipes and tips. Um, and it also can help you find a recognized program in your area uh, for diabetes management. And then the American Society uh, for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, if that's something that someone is pondering or thinking about, that's a great resource to find resources and physicians that you can speak to. Um, and then there's local diabetes nutrition and counseling um, that's available and covered by your insurance at most local hospitals. Um, and then the CDC has this program for diabetes and prevention program. So if you take the risk assessment on the American Diabetes Association and you find you're at risk for diabetes, go ahead and try to find a, a D, it's called the DPP4 program, the Diabetes Prevention Program. Try to find one in your area. And most of them are either free or at a very low cost. Um, and then um, lastly, I have here is the Obesity Medicine so Association. And again, um, you can find resources that will lead and guide you to uh, physicians as well as articles to read. Um, if you think, hey, you know, this might be more than just a, a choice or a lifestyle um, problem for me that it's more, it is a disease and I need help with this. Um, and then lastly, I, I have my, um, my references there, um, but it's about one, I think almost 138. And so I wanted to have some time for some questions and I see it's a couple in the, um, in the chat there. So um, I'm gonna open it up now, I guess, for questions. So Ms. Tellisford, um, let's see, uh, I think I can see. Yes, Mayor. Thank you very much um, for such a thoughtful presentation. I know I've certainly got some work to do. And so again, wanted to thank you. And as you mentioned, uh, now we'd like to extend the opportunity um, for questions. And um, to get us started, I'm gonna ask you about organic food fruits and vegetables. Do we need to purchase organic fruits and vegetables? And add it to that, um, when we buy fish, do we have to buy farm-raised or wild fish? Um, so first, to answer a question about organic um, vegetables and probably organic, I guess I could talk about meat too. So Organic uh, vegetables, it's just, they have a standard because there are certain um, pesticides or certain chemicals that may not be in them. However, um, you know, regular fruits and vegetables, they're going to be helpful and you don't have to buy organic food to be healthy. So if I have a choice between an, oh, I'm going to use broccoli. If I have a choice between broccoli and some organic type of broccoli. I'm just going to get the broccoli, honestly, that's cheaper. 
Um, I'm, I'm not going to buy the organic corn um, because I realized too, and I didn't talk about this much, but the price of food has gone up. It's skyrocketed. So I want you to try to eat as healthy as you can, as wholesome as you can, um, using what you have. And so the cost of your organic food is going to be more. So just wash that extra broccoli off and use that regular broccoli, use those regular carrots, use that other squash. Um, it's okay. Um, you don't have to buy organic. I just want you to get more fruits and vegetables so you get more fiber and eat more grains. Um, and so that's that first question. Um, now I'm gonna say about organic meats, um, there are some advantages again, because it's not the same hormones or, um, or chemicals in the processing form of it. Um, but again, if cost is a factor in purchasing organic products, use the regular products, cut down on the portions that you eat of those products, um, but stay more with your lean protein, like your chicken, your fish, your turkey. Um, so that's the first part. I think I answered Angie. And then you asked me a second part that had to do with fish, I think. So again, with fish, um, what's always going to be best is wild caught uh, fish. Um, so there are some fish products that are farm raised. Um, but what is going to be better for you is the wild caught um, products. Keisha, we have a follow up to um, our question about fish. Which fish are better? So from a heart healthy perspective, um, that is going to be your more fatty fish um, in which you can get your omega um, fatty acids from. So that's going to be um, like your salmon. Um, sardines are a good source of uh, protein as well as the um, omega-3s. Um, so another, I'm trying to think of another meaty fish offhand. So that's it, sardine, salmon. Um, oh, what is my other fish that's usually really good? Uh, I'm going to think and come back to you. But salmon, of course, your fish with your omega-3 fatty acids are going to be best. So yes, you can eat flounder. Um, yes, you can eat uh, yes, thank you, Ms. T. Mackerel, cod, those are all good types of fish as well. My mind went blank on fish. Um, but yes, the, the salmon is actually definitely um, one of the best fish for you. Okay. Um, but yes, cod and mackerel, sardines, um, you're going to get your omega-3 uh, fatty acids in all of those fishes. Okay. And then um, just to piggyback on that a little bit, how many servings a week a fish are recommended? Um, you know, I don't think that I have an actual amount of servings for fish a week. I would just say more about um, balance. Um, some people, they choose to eat fish every day. So, I mean, that's healthy. Um, the, the meats that I say you stay away from is there's always a, a limit on the amount of like red meat you should eat. You want to eat red meat less you want to eat more of your, your chicken and your fish uh, more. Um, so there isn't a limit on saying, oh, you should only eat fish three days a week. Um, you, that's something that's considered healthy for the most part. And so having a balanced diet um, is what I like to say is better. So make choices. Um, so you're not eating the same thing all the time, um, but eat as much fish as you, you would like of those good fish, I would say. Okay, and it looks like we have a few more questions about food. And the next question speaks to canned and frozen fruits and vegetables. Can you give us any guidance on those, please? Um, can, uh, frozen is always better because frozen has less preservatives, uh, less sugars in them. Um, sometimes with your canned vegetables, um, if you have problems with blood pressure, you need to watch your sodium intake. Some of those can have uh, hidden sodium, hidden salt. Um, so I would prefer you to eat uh, fresh or frozen vegetables over canned vegetables. But if you can only get canned vegetables, look for the ones with no salt, um, no sodium added. 
um, or perhaps if you have some that you need to eat in your cabinets, just pour the water off of them, um, rinse them, pour the water off again, and that would help. Um, so yes, fresh or frozen um, is definitely going to be better. Okay, thank you. And then we hear often about certain foods we should have daily, like blueberries. Any guidance on that? And in addition to blueberries, are there other types of fruit we should look towards eating daily? So your blueberries, your raspberries, um, all of your berries, they tend to um, have more antioxidants in them, which antioxidants have been shown to be healthy for you. Um, so again, the berries you can tend to eat more of, you get more in the serving size. Um, they tend to have less uh, sugar in them. So some of the fruit that tend to have a higher sugar concentration might be like your melons or um, your bananas. And sometimes those are the things that we have to eat less of. Um, so berries in general, um, they also, some of them have seeds and the seeds can help with your fiber and your digestion. Um, so those are very uh, good foods for us to eat. Okay. And we have another question that asks about, what about shellfish? shrimp, crab, lobster, when you can afford it? Um, so shellfish, uh, shrimp, uh, crab, lobster, um, they're all, um, I would say to some degree, they're probably good um, as compared to some of the other meats. Um, but some shellfish, especially if you buy it frozen, um, I'm thinking particularly the shrimp, um, it can have higher levels of sodium in it. Um, it's not bad to eat, but you just want to watch that because of the, the sodium. Um, and then some people have some different allergies to shellfish, but if that's not your concern or problem, um, again, not a bad thing for you to eat, but your fish is going to be a little bit better choice of the seafood because you're getting more nutritional um, aspects or components from the fish in the omega-3 fatty acids versus the shellfish, the shrimp, the crab, the lobster. Um, it doesn't really have a good nutritional value for us. Okay. Um, but it's definitely low in, I would say, fat. Um, but, and you also have to watch again the sodium if those things are frozen because that's how they preserve them. Okay. And now we're gonna pivot to a diabetes question. And the chat reads, why does body fat around the stomach help cause diabetes? So one of the things with um, diabetes is it's the way your body um, processes and gets rid of uh, sugar. So, and it's a problem with insulin sensitivity. So when you have type two diabetes, your body's not making or producing as much insulin as it should. And so insulin, um, again, remember it's a hormone. And so when we're not making enough and we tend to exercise and we tend to move, our body then burns that uh, sugar a little bit more. So when we have abdominal obesity, what happens is insulin is a hormone. It acts kind of like a little key and it enters our muscle cells, our liver cells and our fat cells. So what happens is when you have a larger area of fat around your abdominal area, the insulin can't penetrate and go through the fat cells as easy. And so it makes it harder. So the extra fat, the insulin can't work as hard, blood sugars go up. The extra fat, you're exercising, you're not burning um, all the sugar up as quickly as you could if you didn't have all of the fat. Um, so that's kind of why the stomach, I'm reading the question again, but that's kind of what happens with diabetes abdominal fat um, and why the blood sugars go up um, is because the insulin is resistant. The insulin is not able to get through the fat that's stored in that area. Okay, thank you. And so when I have my annual physical, should I assume my physician is testing um, me to, to, for blood, for diabetes, or is that something that I need to ask? So generally when you go and you have your annual physical and you get um, a blood panel done, just a basic blood panel, um, one of the tests that the doctor usually includes in that is um, 
you're a fasting um, blood sugar. Um, and so that fasting blood sugar will indicate, okay, is your blood sugars in a normal range or are they elevated? Um, but what you should do is I would encourage you to ask your doctor because a lot of times now we go in, we get lab work done. Um, we don't know our results immediately. They get sent to us in these patient portals. And sometimes we go back and we look at it and sometimes we don't look at it. And so essentially what happens is I may not look at my blood work or my lab work unless I get a, a notice or ping that some levels are elevated. So I don't know what my fasting blood sugar was the last six months I went to the doctor. So I encourage you to ask your doctor, you know, say, hey, am I at risk for diabetes? Am I at risk for kidney disease? Am I at risk for heart disease? Um, what are those tests that I should be looking at? What are those values I should be looking at? And so that way, you know, for yourself, if last year my fasting blood sugar was 85 when I went to the doctor, and this year my fasting blood sugar on my blood work was 105. Well, I know that there's a change. And then I need to know, okay, well, what is the, the normal range of my fasting blood sugar? Um, the normal range of your fasting blood sugar, if you don't have diabetes, um, it should be under 100. So, you know, you don't know that unless you look at the lab work and you kind of see what the range is. So I would encourage you to just ask your doctor to point out those things to you. Um, because often I see... You know, you go from one year, no diabetes, the next year you've got diabetes. And, and oftentimes people are like, well, what happened? What happened was you didn't know you were at risk last year and the numbers kind of just kept going up. So ask your doctors and have a conversation with your doctors um, so they can answer your questions about, you know, what are your risk factors? What things you should be looking for? Okay. And something you said that I, I'm going to ask you, if you could please define for us, what is a fast, what, is, what does it mean to ask for a fasting test? What does that mean? So a fasting test is, and I'm going to stop my uh, sharing my screen here, uh, Ann. Um, a fasting test is you go to the doctor um, and you've been fasting more than eight hours. So you haven't had anything to drink. You haven't had anything to eat. Um, and the doctor goes in, you do your blood work. Um, and that's considered fasting. And a lot of times um, they'll tell us before we do our physical, when you get your physical, they'll be like, go in for blood work. Um, and so that's what the, the fasting blood, blood sugars are. Okay. And you said during your presentation that these wellness screenings are usually covered by our health insurance, private health insurance, and for also Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, they are. And so if you have diabetes, um, you have never um, received any type of counseling or education, um, ask your doctor about that because that benefit is covered um, for you to be able um, to see, you know, to be able to talk to someone about diabetes and how to manage your diabetes. Um, or nutrition therapy, how to manage, you know, what you're eating. Um, and for Medicare, uh, what Medicare covers is Medicare covers um, 10 hours of group, group diabetes education uh, for Medicare beneficiaries. If you don't have Medicare and you have private insurance, um, your insurance too will cover group education and group classes for diabetes management. Um, and then Many um, insurances, if you uh, decide on um, like weight loss surgery or you want to do something like weight loss surgery um, because you're, you've been having a hard time losing weight and you've tried other measures, um, most insurance um, will, will uh, have you do in nutrition therapy or individual nutrition therapy first to make sure, okay, you tried everything, you have a good knowledge and understanding of the foods you should eat um, before they'll actually just say, hey, you can get weight loss surgery. Um, and so that's, that's something that's important that you to know that you do have these benefits through your insurance. Okay. And these groups that you're speaking to, are they in person? Are, are they virtual? Are they both? 
So the, the diabetes education classes, um, it depends. So different insurances um, have different programs. Um, some programs currently now they meet virtually. Um, some still have in-person sessions. So if you're interested in um, diabetes education and nutrition therapy, um, I would say check with your local hospitals in the area or local programs in the area to find out, you know, can I attend virtually or can, you know, maybe your preference to go in person, um, but they offer a variety of, of different programs. Okay, thank you for that. And now many of us are back at work and um, when we have these sedentary jobs, what can we do throughout our day to move a little bit more? So um, I would say, uh, you know, because we are back at work and some of us are still not back at work. Um, but one thing that I encourage you to do is after you've been sitting for so long, you've been at your computer, you've been at a desk, get up and move. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, in a perfect world, you'd get up and move every hour, but that's not always possible because you're busy. Um, but when you're sitting at the desk, uh, look up online. Um, you know, there's exercises you can do in a chair, uh, whether that's pumping your feet, raising your, um, your legs, kicking out your, your knees. Um, if you get an exercise bike to put under your, uh, your desk to move. Um, but you want to try to move as much as possible um, during the day. Um, and even if you're at home, moving as much as possible to, you know, walk to the mailbox, walk back, walk down the hallway if you're in an apartment building, do a flight of steps if you can, um, but you want to move. One of these, um, I have a watch, a little activity counter here, and it'll tell me like right now, it has a little man with a seat because I've been sitting for the last 50 minutes or so, um, but it will encourage you where you can set these uh, Fitbits and smartwatches that say, hey, you know what, it's time to move. And sometimes just that um, will help you and encourage you uh, to move a little bit better. Thank you, Keisha. Looks like we have uh, about two minutes. So I'm gonna sneak in. If no one else in the audience has a question, I'm gonna sneak in um, two questions. And one, something you spoke to very interesting to me is gut health. What is that, please? So gut health, um, and I'm not an expert in gut health, but gut health is a lot of times when we experience um, being overweight, um, we have that abdominal fat. Um, it, it is just the acids in our gut from the food that we eat. Um, that can cause a lot of different problems. Um, we hear uh, mentioned sometimes of like fatty liver disease. Um, and again, it is contributed to, you know, you have, um, you have more abdominal fat, you have more, uh, they call it visceral fat, um, the acids in your stomach um, from the foods that you eat. Um, it contributes to not having good gut health. Um, and sometimes, you know, you hear people talk about uh, probiotics to help with that, um, to give those um, different, um, you know, uh, well, the different, um, I guess, nutrients in those probiotics to help to kind of cleanse the gut of bacteria. So yeah, so gut health has to do with all the bacteria that's associated with our gut, as well as that uh, level of obesity um, that surrounds our middle section and area. Okay, thank you. And my last question, and have just a minute, if anyone in the audience has a question, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. And while we wait, my last question, it speaks to juicing. We're approaching summer, um, juicing, the prevalence of it is uh, on every commercial. What are your thoughts about juicing to get those fruits and vegetables in? Um, I think that it can be done. It, juicing works really well for some people. Um, I caution you for juicing. If you have diabetes, um, I would just caution that, you know, a lot of times juicing, you use different fruits um, to put in um, 
or the shakes. I'm thinking shakes and smoothies too, Angie. So you use different juices. You put them in the juicer. Again, think about three or four oranges. Um, if you have diabetes, it's going to probably raise your blood sugar if you just had juice with fruit. Uh, and I think bananas, strawberries. Um, however, there's more plant-based juices um, or more plant-based smoothies. Um, and those comprise of your non-starchy uh, vegetables. Um, those are going to be, or the green smoothies, or the green juice. Um, they're going to be maybe a little bit better for someone that has diabetes. Um, so they're not getting all the extra sugar from fruit. Um, another thing that you could try doing is you can mix the berries with the greens. Um, so you're, you're more likely to not have the high sugary fruits like the banana or the melons. Um, so still you got to have some greens. So I think it's fine, but it's about a balance. Um, I also tell people if you like to juice or you like smoothies um, and you have diabetes, uh, you need to be mindful of, okay, well, what is my blood sugars before I have this juice? What is my blood sugars two hours after I have this juice? Um, if you see a big rise in your blood sugars, then that means you need to change the juice up. Um, you need to do a different combination. Um, but a lot of times people use smoothies and juice as meal supplements. So if that's what you're using it for. It might be wonderful and can work. But if you're doing that and you're doing meals, it's probably going to be a little bit too much for you. Um, but it definitely is something that um, can be beneficial um, for you. And you can get a lot of nutrients from um, juicing and having um, smoothies. Well, thank you. That's a perfect segue. Um, for teaching us how to live in balance a little bit better. Uh, it's two o'clock. If we don't have any additional questions, I'm going to thank you, Keisha, and give everyone back their day. And again, thank you for teaching us of how to live better and to live in balance and to do what we all should do to avoid diabetes. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.